You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the BH app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan White. Greetings and welcome to the BH Photography Podcast. Some of the most memorable pop culture photographs ever captured are pictures taken on movie sets. Today we're going to be talking with two photographers who earn their respective livings as film and TV still photographers. Jojo Wilden is a multifaceted photographer and videographer. Her fine Art Photography has been exhibited at the Clamp Art Gallery here in New York City, the Center of Photography at Woodstock, and the South Bank Center in London. JoJo's work has been published in The Guardian, Vanity Fair, and Art Forum, but her primary gig is as a film and television stills photographer. This year, JoJo was the 2018 recipient of the Society of Camera Operators Lifetime Achievement Award in Still Photography. Her clients include Netflix, HBO, CBS, and Killer Films, and she has shot stills for shows including Orange is the New Black, Homeland, Ryan Murphy's new series Pose, and the film's high art, Silver Linings, Playbook, and Tamara Jenkins' new movie, Private Life. David Giesbrecht is an editorial and stills photographer with an equally long and impressive credit list. He's worked on feature films including Friends with Benefits, Rabbit Hole, and Fear X. His TV work has included shooting stills for Jessica Jones, Gotham, The Blacklist, The Good Wife, Gossip Girl, and the last four seasons of House of Cards. Welcome, JoJo. Welcome, David, to the show. Thank you, Alan. Nice having you guys here. Thanks, guys. First off, what do you call your craft? Are you still photographers, production stills, publicity? What, what do you dis- how do you describe what you do? So our designation officially, if you look at the credits, is still photographer. And that's to differentiate us within the camera unit who are using actually moving, moving images to make theirs. So those are cinema photographers. Okay. And these on these phrases like on set stills and publicity stills or stills folks, do you they Those just are, yeah, they're, I think generally people. descriptive. The yeah. there's you know the slang, you know often people don't know my name and they just call me, Hey Stills. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which hey. is which is the nice part. Right, you know, right, occasionally right. you know, they use other terms, but other than that. And how often do you find yourself kind of saying, No, no, we're the stills photographers and then they go, Oh, you know, what are stills photographers doing on a movie set? Does that happen? I guess not in the production sense, but in the outside world? Oh, I think you'd be surprised at actually people going, what are you actually doing here? Right, right. What do they do with these? Yeah. You know, is it archival or whatever? Right. And uh, yeah, I don't think, yeah, it's surprising. You would think that a lot more people would be, I guess, uh, familiar right. with uh, you know what happens with uh, the stuff that we do. And, yeah. And you're talking about on set, the the, the other production people that you're working yeah. with. Yeah. yeah, you're talking to PAs, yeah. you're talking right. to grips, you're talking... Right. Or often actors, or actors, <laughs> often, <laughs> yeah. like new young actors. Sure. Um, you know, like on a show like Orange is the New Black, a lot of our actors are, you know, don't have a lot of experience and wondered what I did. So I, I love when actors ask me because then I get a chance to talk to them about what I'm doing and then they're often a lot more helpful and friendly and I need their support really to get great pictures. Who, who hires you when, when you uh, go on to a new uh, set or a TV show? Most of my work comes from studios or networks. Um, they'll call me to cover a show, um, but there's also a lot of work that comes from the producers directly if it's more of a independent show or... Uh, one part of the job that we do is uh, we do um, art department stills. So that's the photography that's used within the show. And there's a lot more of that now because of screens. And uh, the. What, what, when per- is, what are screens? You know, like on uh, that new show, Bull, uh, in their control room, they have screens of all the uh, potential okay. jury people. All so right. they have. Oh, I think they have like a full-time still photographer who just takes portraits of the background jury members so that they can display them on the screen because the productions have to own the rights to everything, you know, that they're going to broadcast. So it's cheaper to just hire one of us to come and 
produce that work. Do you have set shot lists that you're given? Do you have like a sign, hey, we need this, 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 or are you basically set loose and you know what you got to get? How's it work? It, it depends on the client. Like occasionally you will have, you know, the publicity department come and say, you know, we're looking for such and such on a day. These are the scenes. This is kind of, you know, what we're looking for. But I think uh, that's fairly rare. Usually, you know, once you've, you know, established a rapport with your, your client, then they know you know what to get. Mm-hmm. I wanted to jump back to the point we were talking about earlier with the the rest of the people on set who often don't know what you're what you're up to, and uh, does that often get frustrating to a degree to have to explain what you're doing and how important the work is after the fact? I mean, I know that on a production, everyone's kind of focused on you know getting that stuff done, getting getting the work done, maybe getting the day done. They're not necessarily thinking about when when everything's wrapped. Do you? Does that bother you after a while? And you know, if you don't, I don't want you to diss other people, but it's more about like, hey, you should know this by now, and and if you don't, take a look at what happens, you know, after the fact. Well, I think the only time it really comes into an issue is if you know you're under the crunch as a group trying to produce for the day, and you know you need to you know get what you need mm. for the client that hopefully publicizes the the project after the fact. And if you're not given that room to actually, you know, get some of these key things just because, you know, it's not convenient, you know, you'd ask them, can you, I just grab 30 seconds to just do this and, mm. and you'll get, you know, brushed off because it's like, you know, we're an hour and a half behind on our day and then you're into overtime. And so that can be even frustrating because, you know, it's like, it is important that we mm. all kind of, you know, it's cyclical. Yeah. You make this par- project go, We'll come back and do this again, and part of that process is the you know the publicity and marketing images. Yeah, yeah. And who, I do I do not um, get frustrated generally when people ask me what I do and why I'm there. And again, it's mostly actors or young PAs who are new to the business. I would say the professional crew they know what's going on. They know why we're there and. It's very tribal working on a film set. So if you know people, and I rarely walk on a set where I don't know people anymore, um, they're going to let me in and let me get my shots. And, um, you know, it's generally a good working relationship. The thing that I can get sometimes frustrated about is when people come ask me about my equipment, mostly Mm. guys, and they're like, Oh, what camera do you use and all that? And then, then I'm like, What's your setting? Why do you care? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't go read. You know, it's right. not. That's not why I'm hired because of my equipment. Right. So, right. Yeah, I think yeah. that translates to a lot of photographers oh, too. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So officially, you guys are part of the camera department, right? Yeah. Um, but in real- reality, you're kind of a team of one, or right? I mean, yes. I mean, you need to obviously make nice with everybody on set and certainly with the camera people uh, and, and the boom operators. Uh, but uh, but at the end of the day, y- you know, you don't have that, someone doesn't have your back, as it were, you know. Do you um, ever work in teams? I mean, we're assuming that you're, you're one photographer working on a huge production, but I imagine some big movies, would they have more than one still shooter or no? Um, not generally. You may have multiple units, so then you have oh, okay. a possibility of, you know, Two soloists, you know, uh, you know, it's the same project, but of course in different locations. You know, so, you, um, so you, you really are flying solo on that. This is you, you own the whole thing. Okay, that's good. I, I like that myself. Do they ever bring in? They must sometimes bring in a um, another photographer. F- let's say maybe they're from an outside organization to do some documentation or a story. Or what if they're setting up a different kind of shot, like a, a not not a production still so much as a, something oh, like a, for a poster or... Key artwork, yeah. uh, like what art does. Um, yeah, they usually don't do that during on a production day because it's, you know, it's too distracting for production. So it would be on a weekend or something. But occasionally we'll have... Um, I've had uh, Brigitte Lacombe come to set to do, you know, portraits or behind the scenes Um on shows and a couple of other Mar- Mary Ellen Mark used to do that and okay. there's a few you know they have to be pretty high profile photographers to get that access um, but I always welcome them I, I love to you know have another photographer come 
join the clan. And usually <laughs> the guys will like protect me and be like, who's that lady with the camera? Right, right. The girl with the camera. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, so I, they close around me. Yeah. I'm like, it's okay. She's okay. Don't, don't scare her. She's, you know. Right. <laughs> Something that just came to mind. Uh, we're talking about still uh, uh, photographers coming in as movie sets. I think some of the, one of the strongest bodies of work I'd seen way back when there was a movie, Little Big Man with uh, Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. And Ernst Haas did a lot of, I don't know if he was the still photographer, but he did a whole thing of all of the action there. And they were all time exposures and blurs the entire series. It was phenomenal in color. And it was, it was just gorgeous. And I remember I was a youngster back then, but that stopped me and made me take a look at what photographs can be. And here's a guy who was interpreting a movie in motion. And I found it to be fascinating. So it's worth checking out. Yeah, I just heard um, also that Nan Golden did a bunch of work on That's the true. Deuce oh, yeah. uh, for yeah. HBO. Yeah, I saw that too. Yeah, um, I think they probably had one of our still photographers there at the same time for that as mm. well. But they were using her work as a visual reference for their production design and cinematography. Right. I think she was and, actually in it too. I yeah, think, yeah, and they, I think yeah. they put her in it right. as well. Right, right. Yeah, I, I saw. So that. I'm curious yeah. to yeah. see those. Do the images that end up on the, say, the poster or or the uh, for a TV show, whatever the, the main picture is, are those are those pictures that you take too, or do they bring in other people, or is it could be either or? It could be either or. It depends. Like, um, yeah, I have a collection of one sheets, especially you know, especially from indie stuff where you know you've caught in the character in a certain thing, or even on some of these big jobs, you have guys like Jason Boland who you know shoots an amazing image of uh, Matt Damon, and that's the cover shot, the big poster shot mm -hmm. for. Uh, the, um, those movies, those yeah. movies, <laughs> yeah, born movies, born, born movies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so occasionally, right. you know, you can tell sometimes. I guess uh, you know if it's you know it's kind of a studio setup, and sometimes even you know I've had the opportunity to shoot some uh, like well, gallery shots, one sheets for certain projects. Mm. And is the poster kind of the ultimate goal for you guys? I mean, or is the ultimate? I don't know how to say goal, but the, I don't really the payoff. Think about the poster that much. Um, I'm satisfied if I – I think the New York Times has great taste in mm. photography. Mm -hmm. So whenever they pick one of my photos to feature, and it's usually something I liked as well, mm -hmm. that makes me very happy. But And do you get the yeah. – is there credit on there? I mean, Yes. The New York Times is great about, about giving credit. Right. And um, if they don't or they make a mistake, I have their – Email and they correct it immediately. <laughs> oh, that's great. Who, who owns your photographs when you work on these productions? You... It's a total buyout. The studios own them. And, so. and what about your use of them? Are you allowed to use them at all for like, well, I know if you're on promotion, I would guess. Uh, but say somebody called up and said, we want to use this. Do you have any rights at all or is this just, it's a paycheck? Uh, basically, you have to refer them because, you know, as a technicality, you do not own the copyright. Gotcha. You don't have the ability to do resale. So, you know, if, you know I've had... Uh, People email me, especially from out of country, you know, oh, can we, you know, we would like to use this photo. How much would you charge? And I always have to, of course, you know, legally go, okay, well, you want to contact so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so because they're actually the copyright holders. Right. So, and I would like to work again. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know, I, I noticed the the high maintenance, uh, was that a poster or a yeah. street poster? That was, I really liked that one. Yeah. It's something they did, you know, I don't know if they pulled that from a still or, or how that was arranged. Yeah. That was, uh, yeah, just, uh, on the street with them. That was yeah. kind of fun. So sure. when those, you know, especially if it's something a little bit not so generic and it's kind of quirky and kind of gets to the field, then that's mm -hmm. nice to see, oh, they took sure. that and they added the rainbow. Well, I can dig that. That's, totally. That's totally. nice use of my stills. Yeah, yeah. 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 Now, uh, speaking of the Ernst Haas and, and being a little experimental, uh, do you still indulge in that and, and try to have fun on set and create images that you probably know won't ever be used for straight up publicity, but who knows, might get pulled out for a poster or something that is not a, you know, maybe with long exposure or some other kind of effect that you could throw in? Definitely. Um, and I think different clients uh, encourage that more than others and... Um, I, I love to try and do that. And I, I think now where I'm at in my career, I realize that some people are hiring me because they do expect that. And um, like I, I'm starting on a pilot tomorrow for Turner and they sent me, a, you know, a photo reference guide for what they like. And it was very 
arty and it looked a lot like my work. So I was like, oh, mm-hmm. okay, I see what's Good. going on here. And <laughs> I made sure, and you know, to tell the photo editor right. I love the references and I'm on the same page. So they had but, a photo editor from, it's like a yeah. Turner production photo editor who... Okay, yes, yeah. all those big networks have photo departments mm-hmm. with editors. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they're called publicists, photo publicists. They seem to have different names depending on the organization, but they are you know, the gatekeepers who hire us and process the images and distribute them to their, you know, media. I would imagine it's pretty competitive, or am I wrong about that? Because there are just so many movies and TV shows going on, and I imagine a lot of people would like to be on those sets shooting there. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's the thing about being kind of like the lone wolves, you know, it's uh, you know, friends with many other still photographers, and but logically they are my direct competition. But I think it's you know you have uh, you know it's great to see you know if you're friends with them, you're great to see your friends doing great work, and you go, oh, that was an amazing project, and you know glad to see you know what you did there. Mm-hmm. You know sometimes you go, oh, I you know, missed that job, so and so got it. So it's like you know. Oh, well, next <laughs> time. Next time. <laughs> you know, can, I'll meet I, you next time. I, well, it's, it's a friendly rivalry. Can I just throw this in now? I wanted to wait to the end, but when I moved back to New York now eight years ago, um, I was looking for work and trying to get reestablished, and I joined a, a chat group for public, publicists and still photographers, and I threw out, hey, I'm looking for work, and one person who I never met before or really didn't know, named David, uh, called emailed me and said, hey, uh, you know, I can't do this job. Would you be interested? And he kind of passed it on to me. So I always wanted to kind of thank you publicly for that. It was a really, really nice gesture. And, and this uh, payback. Uh, he owes you nothing, nothing. now. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah, uh, David like, yeah. is an awesome cheerleader yeah. for everyone on the Stills team. Yeah, mm-hmm. he's always been a friendly and supportive mm-hmm. rival. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. But they do also have, you know, what I guess additional still photographers, or maybe y- you can't do a whole production. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that, where in the sense that, and this may get us into the whole aspect of the union and whatnot, but are you on set every day, or does that change? And uh, it depends what do on they the do? contract. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, for television, uh, the still photographer is not a mandatory staffing requirement, so mm-hmm. they don't have to have us every day. But anyone who works as a photographer on the show has to be in the union. Mm-hmm. For major films, uh, they they do have to have a photographer. And for low-budget films, they don't have to have a photographer mm-hmm. every day. But across the board... You have to be in the union to work on the set. And an additional photographer usually means, like I was saying with Spider-Man, I just did the New York City unit, mm-hmm. and it was a, you know, a photographer out of England who did the main portion of the film. But I would be an additional photographer in that sense because I'm just picking up the five days in New York. Gotcha, yeah. Yeah. I've done that a couple of times. Um, I also wanted to ask about behind-the-scenes photos. Do you uh, enjoy doing them? Do you... Uh, how do the people on set feel about it in general? And um, what happens to all of them when you're done with them? Because I not too many of them get seen, I imagine. Tons uh, of requests for behind the scenes now because of social media. Mm. And I would say that's one of the biggest changes in the last few years is that the studios are really want good behind the scenes photographs oh. of the actors. And in general, most of the actors are taking them anyway with their iPhones and other people are taking photographs with iPhones behind the scenes. Are there, are that's there a big issue. restrictions on that? With oh, Absolutely, yes. yeah. Yeah, yeah for all intents and purposes, but when you sign a contract, you're yeah. signing an NDA, so. Right. Yeah. Okay. And how, have, how tied are you to the camera position, the main camera position when shooting here? Ass- assuming you're not doing behind the scenes, obviously, but uh, for a lot of the production stuff, are you tied to camera position? Because I imagine a lot of the lighting is so specific for a lot of the shots. Uh, or do you basically play back and forth between camera position and whatever you see? Uh, I think it uh, depends, you know, you know, like every project has its own gestalt, its own way of working, and you got to figure out how you can represent it the best within that system. A lot of times, yeah, like a, on House of Cards, me and Gary J were tight. Mm-hmm. It was always with him all the time, and it was a strong, almost kind of single camera show with the A camera doing most of the stuff. And so to represent that in that angle, a lot of times I'd be 
you know, right up with them. Occasionally you see a situation where, and that what I think makes, even it gives us a little bit of value, you'll see an off angle that really kind of reflects something from the show and gets, you know, you know, things that you see with your eye that, you know, your publicity marketing team go, oh, you know, this, this works. Mm -hmm. And I've had people complain and go, oh, I love that shot, but I didn't actually see it in the films. Like, well, yeah, <laughs> I was making my own little movie. Well, I was going to ask, him, yeah. is that kind of one of the other thrills of, uh, you know, and as opposed to the poster or some other kind of, or the, the New York Times, but kind of getting a photo that the DP didn't set up and that's yours and uh, it's great and everyone recognizes it and maybe it gets used for publicity. That must be a nice little... Uh, I love when that happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Have um, you ever had... They, but also, just to go back to what David said, um... The, you know, I would think also with House, House of Cards, a lot of the framing is so symmetrical and mm. tableau-ish that um, you you do want to represent that. Right. And one place, we both work for Netflix a lot, and they use the photos for the menus on the screens, oh, and yeah. they have an algorithm that um, – uh, makes unique menus for every user. I've been reading about that. Yeah. In, in a, there's some little behind-the-scenes stuff that's kind of weird going on with that, too, in terms it, of profiling of people. Yeah. And whatnot. Yeah. 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 And um, But now I, I have that in my brain, too, when I'm mm. working on Netflix shows. <laughs> like, this is going to become a menu picture right. and with several possible, you know, different configurations and how is it going to represent this episode and... You know, so there's a lot to think about. But um, also going back to the camera position is, you know, there's, you can figure out pretty quickly what the, you know, production's formula is for shooting something. So they might have a master and two overs or different medium close-up shots. And, you know, one thing that helps me is to kind of anticipate where they're going to go so I can get ahead of them or get behind them and still get you know, a really symmetrical shot if that's the flavor they're going for and, um, you know, not be in the way. So I'm trying to, do you know what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. if you're trying to get a really symmetrical shot, there's usually Something only in, one position right, for that right, shot. Right, right. right, That's what I always found one of the greatest challenges and somehow the, the, the best, the most enjoyable challenge is to find that angle where you're, no, there's not a, a light stand in the way, right. and, and you're out of the way, but it's still a, represent, a representative shot. And yeah. uh, that was kind of, I guess this leads to a question, what are some of the the skills that uh, you guys need to have that might not apply to the rest of the world of photography? Uh, and and that would be one, certainly. Well, kind of. yeah, you, know, you have to think ahead, you know, and, uh, you know, understand obviously what the client wants that's not different from other photographers but I think you just have to really be a team player too mm. and um, you know make sure that you are everyone else on set is comfortable with you being there mm -hmm. so that means the actors the camera department the ADs the director if mm -hmm. you make all of them you know comfortable <laughs> with you that's you a can, skill right there right yeah. it's <laughs> yeah. I would say it's half my job, basically. Sure, pretty much. Sure. Yeah. I wanted to ask, I, most of the, the movies I've worked on were really independent, so there, it wasn't always an issue, but I, I worked on one where they brought in an assistant director from Hollywood, uh, and a big, uh, more of an established L.A. guy to kind of run this indie set, and everything changed. I mean, he had an iron fist, and, you know, there was just a, a very limited amount of time. Is the AD somebody who determines your life when you're on the set or do you find ways around that if necessary? And assistant director is what I'm referring to. Yeah. Um, you guys know. I think it's it's one of those weird positions. You are kind of nebulous when you're working within the group because, mm -hmm. of course, the assistant director is basically the on-set supervisor manager of what's actually happening for the scene. So he'll be you know, going back and forth between the director, the, the director of photography, and even like the keys just to make sure that everything is in the place and to keep track of time and make sure, you know, the train keeps running. Right. He's the conductor. Um, a lot of times I have, I have good relationships with uh, a lot of the first ADs that I know, but they don't, unless they need something from me specifically for production, we don't generally interact unless we're just, you know, shooting the breeze because you're mm -hmm. kind of a nebulous person that floats okay. between all these different mm -hmm. departments as they're doing their jobs. Right, right. And in, in certain 
productions, is it where they'll call you in and say, okay, now, take the photos now and then, you know, go grab some food for the next couple hours or it doesn't work that way? I would say, um, I would say they're, yeah, generally most of the ADs I work with are great and, you know, easy to work with, but I think they're, I have run across an AD or two who have, uh, they don't like to have the still photographer on set and mm -hmm. uh, make it difficult. Yeah. And they can make it very difficult just by saying, leave set. <laughs> well, um, how are you supposed to do your job if you're not there? Well, I, I, I <laughs> as soon as I as someone says no to me, uh, you know, I can be a dog with a bone. I'm not going to, I, I right. won't back down. Right. I'll get my photo. Right. I'll go over their head or talk them into it or go directly to the actor I yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have to figure. It's on you. There's no one there to get your back. You have to figure out a way to still yeah. get your. Photo. At the end of the day, you got to bring home the pictures. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. if the AD did do that, then they would literally they would have to let you go back in and take a picture and yeah, you know yeah. Or you would say, I'm going to tell the studio I don't have this picture because of you. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then they usually back down. Yeah. Anyway. Are there any differences between working on a, a feature film and I say a TV series as far as your work day? I think as far as the work day, um, generally I think on network stuff you don't do the long hours or as long. So don't you know it's all client specific. You know they'll want to either do you know they'll cap it at an eight hour day because they don't want to do overtime. But that, that aside, though, even just your working procedures, your pro procedures, once again, I think it's with everything, it's specific to the project. Some projects, you know, they'll do, they're all handheld, they're run and gun. That can be, there's feature films that are shot like that, there's TV series that are shot like that, or you can be very methodical, like on House of Cards, it was very much set, and, you know, this is kind of, you know, it was a, a machine in the way that was just so kind of on point all the time. Okay, this is, we set this, we set this, to doom, to doom, and there's, you know, and you get that same thing with certain feature films. So in that way, there's a lot of similarities. So, But I, I think the only really big difference a lot of times, unless it's a small project, you are probably just running at a faster pace on a, a TV project because you're trying to do, we call them page counts. You're, that's the how they determine, you know, the, count the scenes and mm -hmm. the lines and whatever, that you'll be probably doing a lot more pages per day on a TV set than you would on a film set. Yeah, I think people... And I could be wrong, but they, the outside world, don't really understand how that you guys have to know a lot of photography, all kinds of kind of types of photography skills. If you're on a, a run and gun type of thing, you're almost working like a photojournalist, and you're chasing people, you're getting out of the way, you're you're getting your shots, and then other times you may have to set up lights to make a portrait. And needless to say, there's lots of scenes where you just have to kind of understand the lighting that's been created for you, right, and, and use that. Yeah, um, here's my anecdote for that. I got hired to work on The Fighter with David O. Russell, and that was a big, uh, you know... That was the Mark Wahlberg uh, Mark movie, Wahlberg, right? Mark Wahlberg, Christian yeah. Bale, right. Melissa Leo, Amy yeah, Adams. Good movie. Um, yeah. yeah, and that was a big uh, job for me, and um, I had never done sports photography, and we were starting the project with the th three days of fighting a fight each day that Wahlberg was doing and he wanted to get the fight scenes done so he could relax his training routine and uh, I I did some research and you know had ideas about what kind of pictures I wanted to get out of the fights um, but I you know I just had to I didn't have anyone to tell me how to do it I just had to figure it out and it was the first three days. There was tons of background. We were in this huge arena. I didn't know David. I'd only had one conversation with him. I didn't know Mark. I didn't know Christian Bale. I was a little, like, nervous. Um, they were all wonderful. Um, but I, as soon as I got there, I noticed they had a um, background person as a photographer on the side of the rink. And I was like, I want that position where he is. So... You know, because that's where I'm going to get the good close-ups with the sweat flying and the face punch. And um, so I found whoever I needed to find and said, look, I want to at least one of the days be a background person on the side of the ring. That's and they were idea. like, yeah. 
no problem, but you know you have to stay there the whole day. I'm like, that's that's fine because we're going to be here for three days. So I'll, one day, one of the fights, I'm going to put on that silly little vest and mm-hmm. stand there by the side of the ring. Mm-hmm. So were you as a a photographer? Yeah, like working the sports yeah. event, right? Yeah, okay. which was great. Yeah. So and I just figured it Did out. You paid extra. But, um, no, I didn't. No, okay. <laughs> I probably could have pushed for that, but I didn't. No. Um, so you're kind of doing your job and and also portraying yourself doing your job. That's yeah. pretty cool, right? Because yeah. <laughs> like that, that was really the only place to get the great. <laughs> Did the scene make it angles. into the movie? Did it make it into the movie? The fi- that scene. Um, I don't know. Actually, okay. I didn't look. <laughs> we'll finish the story. I don't want to. Did, yeah, did you know. get your shot? But yeah. I got the shot <laughs> okay. I wanted. I got the shot of the fist punch, right. sweat The fly classic, and, right, right, right. The jaw yeah. getting <laughs> yeah. taken apart. Right, right in the right. jaw, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. have to know lots of different things. Like yeah. You have to do sports photography. You have to mm-hmm. do portrait photography. You have to do, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, uh, to, uh, stunts, weapons, war, whatever, mm-hmm, whatever mm-hmm. they throw at you. Yeah, that's another thing. All the the special effects type of shots, and I'm sure yeah. that all the those guys want that that shot too. Do they? The crew guys come to you and girls say, "Hey, did you get a shot of you know that the car, car blowing yeah, up? Yeah, and can I get one?" And oh, um, <laughs> I don't think not as much anymore, just yeah. with the advent of uh, iPhones. Right, <laughs> right, right <laughs> they're yeah. prolific. Yeah, but back yeah. in the day when you were doing film, go, oh, you know. You know, did you get a picture of that? You know, I'd right. love to see it and get a copy. Right, right. No, it is an issue that is talked about a lot. Uh, but do you guys does it bother you guys personally when you see someone pull out a, a camera or a phone and start taking pictures, or you've kind of learned to live with it? Sometimes it bothers me, and the times it bothers me a lot mm. uh, is when I'm doing. I'm making a picture of a group or a portrait or whatever, and. I realize no one's looking at me, right. and then I look behind me, and there's like four people with iPhones, and their eye lines are all over the place, yeah. and I'm like, this isn't working, you know, mm. we have to have everyone look at the same camera, so, you know, that's when I literally want someone to have my back, because yeah. Yeah. And who would be that person? Who, who would be that? Shouldn't that also be the AD, or, or who would, I mean, they're kind of busy with something else, but... Who should be yeah, there saying, hey? Yeah, it should hey. be whoever, whichever AD is running that unit or if there's a publicist, some of the bigger shows have publicists there mm-hmm. and they should be policing the iPhone use. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not really our job to be policing that, but yeah. um, there yeah. should be people who are yeah. minding it. Yeah. Actually, the question I did have, and, and maybe we can put this in a different spot, um, and without going into specifics, when to, when you're working on a bigger budget movie, do you expect that you'll be your pay will be bigger too, or is it kind of a standard pay based on your seniority and the, and the union and things like that? It's like I tell everyone, what we do on the inside is kind of like the same what you do on the outside. We only have a card, so it's a you know a lot of it comes down to you know negotiations, how you can. Uh, you know, if you can negotiate negotiate yourself a better rate, by all chance, do it. You know, and I don't expect. You know, I don't think. Uh, you know, you're someone with uh, you know certain amount of years in that you should be working at the same level as someone who you know has maybe like a dozen films under their belt. You know, so it is a tough push because you know the downside to having a, a contracted base rate. We can't be paid lower than mm-hmm. a certain amount, but also, of course, they use that to you know. Keep you, keep you down there yeah. when you go, well, mm-hmm. yeah, not so much. Is it ultimately the, the producer, the production company that, that you negotiate with and make that final deal? And once again, it comes down to projects. So mm-hmm. either you're negotiating with the network, you're negotiating, uh, or the studio may ask, oh, what's your rate for this thing? Uh, smaller things you will be negotiating with, you know, a production manager or line producer. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe I want one more question, then we'll take a break and come back and talk in, about gear and a few other things, some techniques. But um, have do you guys have any stories about where you uh, screwed up, where you were, you got into a shot by mistake, or <laughs> you popped a flash? I guess there's never flash on set, but or maybe there is. I don't know. But uh, anything along those lines where you got called out or scolded, or you knew they did the, the wrong thing, or they had to do something over because of your? I mean, I, I, there seems to be, a, in my experience. There's a lot of nerves, a lot of tension, and sometimes some pressure. And a lot know, of things to trip over. And things to trip yes. over and <laughs> bump into, or or the sound of the camera. We can talk about that later and, and, and the, you know, the boom. Um, I don't think I've ever walked into a shot, knock on wood. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm going to tell you what my biggest screw-up was that almost killed me, but I'm not going to name the project. Um, <laughs> 
is that I lost a card. Oh, wow. Yeah. And um, I had, yeah, I, sh- I had shot so much. It was on a feature film, and I had shot so much that it wasn't really missed. But um, mm-hmm. I told the publicist, because there was a publicist on that job, and she said, don't tell anyone. And um, that was it. And I mm. never found it, and I was obsessed on it. We were at this location for a while, and I didn't know exactly where I put it down. And I was more worried about someone taking it than actually yeah. losing it because mm-hmm. I felt like I'd gotten the shots. Um, Would that be the worst that if it got out and somebody else put yeah. it online or something like that, obviously? Yeah. Well, then I'd have to explain it to a lot sure. of people. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, but I think it got it ended up you know, getting swept in the trash. Uh-huh. And it was, uh, I, I believe it was a CF card, and it was when they were still small, like... Yeah. I don't know, two gigabytes or something. Oh. <laughs> so it couldn't have been that much work. But um, yeah, that that was mortifying to me. I was pretty upset about that. I think one of the most mortifying moments of my life was, it was the first day. Uh, and it was uh, early on in my career. And I do pride myself in being fairly nimble. But <laughs> <laughs> we're on a house location. And the camera's on a track and it's dollying back. And... And of course, there's this you know special effects team, and then there you know there's a fireplace. And beside the fireplace is a suppression device. You know you know where this is all going. So there's <laughs> all those wonderful things that are around a fireplace. You've got the poker and the shovel, and of course this uh, fire suppression uh, unit. And as I'm tracking back, I manage to knock it oh, all over oh, well. during a take. During a take, yeah, I think I was. I think I might have caught the poker, but of course I missed the the shovel, and of course down went the uh, the big canister of uh, CO two. Wow! Which and then of course led to whole thing of okay, not actually shooting said actor during a take, so that kind of tripped up the whole show right. for a bit, yeah, and led to a bunch of other. How early was this in your in your career? Uh, this was within, this is probably would, would have been within the first five films, five projects. Oh, well, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> you got over it, right? Have you worked with that team again, that production since? Well, I've worked with a lot of the individuals and actually yeah. the one actor that, that was a problem, I actually did work with him fairly recently. Oh, good. Luckily he doesn't remember me. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to take a short break and come back and talk about gear on set. Stay tuned. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. We are back. Um, let's talk about gear a little bit. I know back in the day, uh, uh, cameras were a lot noisier. And f- if I'm not mistaken, Leica's were okay. And if you shot with anything else, it had to be in a, a Jacobson blimp or something similar to that. Now we have mirrorless cameras. Now we have cameras with silent modes. So is it safe to assume that it's a lot easier to shoot on set and you have a lot more choices of gear? Yeah, I think we have uh, you know you have more options now, and which is actually leads to another thing is you know Jacobson, which is you know was the standard for years and history now is history. Yeah, he uh, retired in August, so yeah. you can only find those units uh, on eBay. Um, yeah, Aquatech got into the game yeah. for a little bit, and they've discontinued. So basically, yeah, I think uh, mirrorless has actually changed the industry, and for you know, and there's some good things. You know, I still, you know, I still pull have my Aquatech with me because I'm shooting with my D5. You need that, mm-hmm. you know, if you're shooting a, a single lens reflex thing. But uh, yeah, to have the option to be have a smaller profile, and uh, with the you know the advent of the technology getting better and the focusing faster, you know, it just it's another piece that uh, you know gives you things you wouldn't be able to been able to get with that big housing mm-hmm. you know you can get closer to the camera Certainly. you can get an odd angle and uh, as much as i like to do you know on set yoga you know i don't have to do the downward dog to get that shot i yeah. can just put the camera down there and flip the screen <laughs> right which is nice yeah 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 <laughs> do you carry a minimal amount of gear with you because like you just mentioned uh, you don't want a lot of big stuff on you because you're never going to bump into something with somebody i imagine you want to maintain a, a, a narrow profile 
when you're out there. Yeah, I think it's it's a lot like uh, you know you're almost like a golfer. You, you know, you've got your kit, you've got your bag, you got all the stuff you need. You know, you look at the shot, you kind of tee it up and go, okay, well, yeah, I think I'll take out the five iron for this shot. And you can always <laughs> just you know walk in and you know be you know have a low profile and go get what you need. And if you need something else, I go, okay. You know, this is when I would like to have actually have a camera caddy. Yeah. But well, I've seen some 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 people that they have like their box uh, on wheels that they they put on the back of the camera truck and they roll it off and they pull out the drawers and they seem totally set up with everything, like a little studio with them. Is that common or most people just show up with a bag? And I have a Pelican case. I um, And I, I, I have... Two Pelican cases, one with my blimp equipment, which I'm bringing less and less now. But um, yeah, I always have a, a small Pelican case because I have to. I I've been using the Fujis, and I the batteries need charging constantly. But we're never somewhere without electricity, so that's not a problem. But um, I have three camera bodies in there, and. Uh, you know, just basic stuff that I'm going to need throughout the day, but I try to keep it pared down. Fast primes or zooms, which or, or a combination of the two. Um, I use zooms now. I used to just use primes, but uh, I I I've switched to zooms a few years back with my Nikon's and never looked back. The Nikon zooms are excellent, and um, just so I can adjust my. You know, focal length, and, and and so you have you have your Nikon still and the Fuji systems, or you I you still have back and forth? both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, okay. I love my Nikon's. I'm right. I'm in love with Nikon, and I'm dating Fuji. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. What about See you on the side? I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah. I'm probably a, uh, a Nikon shooter. You know, we've got my the D5s, the DF. Um, and I'm waiting for my Z6 to be coming. Oh, really? Oh, is that true? Z, yes. Me too. Uh, oh, cool, waiting cool. also oh, yeah. from Interesting. Do you? Will that change everything for you guys then, right? I mean, if it's going to be a silent mirrorless We'll see how Nikon, it goes. See how it goes, right? Yeah, well, you know, the awesome part of that is, you know, being able to use the glass because, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. have a nice collection, have some great lenses yeah. that I still yeah. love to use. So. And yeah, the you, legacy uh, use of all that. Do you have different sets for uh, a different gear that you use on set indoors as opposed to being out on location? Do you differentiate or is it just really depends on what you have to do? I think it's more dependent on what you have to do. Okay. Um, you know, of course, you'll adjust uh, for certain things, you know, doing rain towers or if you're like in inclement weather or, you know, you know, you'll take those things into account of, you know, maybe what piece of gear you're actually going to pull out for that and what's going to be you know, best served. You know, I was in D.C. doing some location work last weekend, and there was a lot of rain, and it actually made a difference, you know, with all just the, the moisture around mm-hmm. and the way they affected and just being out of doors. It was right. still nice to get back and, you know, use the blimp. And, and when, when you, so when you're out of doors or if they're not recording direct sound, do you then just toss that blimp aside and, and start shooting without, or does that become kind of annoying to people? What are you saying, <laughs> toss the blimp aside? <laughs> <laughs> Never? It's yeah, always so, right. sometimes we can yeah. shoot without the blimp, but right. I think David's point was that uh, the blimp has this extra benefit of protection. Keep, protecting yeah, the right. camera, yeah, right, in right, right. inclement weather. So. Yeah, I've, I've and been in fireplaces. Some, and, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And, uh, My um, yeah. Nikon's are in very good condition. Probably so they look know. prime. They look very prime. Yeah. They got out of the back then. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess that leads me or bounces back to the old question: Have has there been a moment where you made noise with your camera that got caught on you know on tape, uh, and you got dirty looks from the sound people? Or you had to redo something, or how often is that uh, an issue? Yeah, I worked on it. Uh, HBO miniseries called um, Olive Kittredge and the sound mixer would record the sound of my Nikon through the blimp and then co- make me come over and listen to it. He was very uh, nice about it, though. Yeah. He was never giving me shade, but um, it was fascinating to hear what it sounded like. <laughs> it was yeah. like this cocoon, even in the blimp. Right. So I'm like, you right. know, I don't know what to do. I'll try not to shoot when they're talking. Yeah. And are you guys uh, heavy on the shutter or... Not so much. Do you tend to shoot a lot? And uh, what's your style? Uh, I think once again, it, you know, it comes down to the project. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's nice just to you know, you know, sniper it, and it's okay. There's the moment and you go and just go pop, pop, yeah. pop. And then there's sometimes where I say, you know, you know, it's an Uzi spray. It's like you got depending on what's happening, and you go, you just hose it down. Just go. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. There's got to be a good one in there someplace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so, yeah, I, the, I echo that. I, I also do a really heavy edit, so mm-hmm. I never turn anything in without um, quality control. And, um, you know, I'll often throw away half the pictures. So. Yeah. Oh, so mm-hmm. you know, that, just, I just want to come back to that point. You don't own the pictures, but you basically give them the edits, So, and you just trash the rest of them. It's not like they say, we want everything. Well, well, they do, but okay. everything to me is after I've gone through and gotten okay. rid of everything that I think I would, you know, not want them to have. So. You're, thinking, you're doing yeah, them a favor think, also. You know, doing them a huge favor. Yeah. It's yeah. the right of first kill. Like, you don't want something to go out that, you know, may look good as a thumbnail, but if you punch it up and then go, oh, it was back focused. Mm-hmm. You know, I've seen some of those things make their way through. through. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like, right. Just better just to have quality work representing yourself. And if you know mm-hmm. yeah. you don't need that blurry shot, you don't need that shot of your foot that you took by accident. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and do you guys edit after each day or do you how much turnaround time do you have to get stuff to people? I guess it depends. I, but, I yeah, s- yeah, easily yeah. spend twenty percent of my time now editing. Ten to twenty percent of my uh, do you edit time. on set like during the day? During the no, shooting? I don't like to because um I don't like to get distracted. Um either from shooting or from editing. Mm-hmm. And it actually goes back to that film I was talking about where I lost the card. Right. That was the situation. I was doing both things. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. And um, now I, I rarely do that. Um, I prefer to um, shoot, go home, see my family, and get up early in the morning and do my edit. Yeah, the day before. Yeah. The days before work. When I, right. my mind's fresh and I right. have a little bit of distance mm-hmm. from what just happened and... Yeah. Do you no. tend to chimp a lot? Well, with the, uh, the, it can't do it with the, uh, with the blimp. Well, with the blimp, you, can, you know, like no, you keep just, looking you at your pictures. Yeah, you make sure that oh. you do. Yeah, yeah. Oh. That's good. Oh, well, well, you can with that kind of blimp, with the uh, Aquatech. With the Aquatech, the, yeah, you have the screen. You can right. always That's the Jacobson, right. you can't do anything. That's correct. Yeah. Not the old yeah. ones, no. Yeah. 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 Huh. Okay. All right. And uh, can we talk a little bit about working with um, with stars? And, and I imagine it's different for every set and every person. But... Um, as you kind of mentioned, some young actors may not even know what you're doing or you have to kind of explain it to them. Do you have to get in the situation where you need to say, well, let's say they called cut, you know, do you then jump in to get a few shots or is that, that doesn't really happen? Uh, I mean, I guess it's different in every situation, but have you ever had, had to ask a, an actor to say, hey, you know, give me that face again or direct the actor a little bit. Does that happen and, and how do they receive that? Yeah, on occasion. And uh, I think it's just like anything else. You know, they're a subject and uh, your responsibility. It's actually part of, you know, being a professional is that a lot of times just to be direct and you make requests. They're, you know, they're your coworkers uh, for all intents and purposes. And you go, okay, well, you know, can I get you just, you know, to be respectful just like you would anyone else if you're, you know, photographing a you know bank president or a politician or even your neighbor. Oh, you know, can you just give me this look? Blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. And you get that thing that you know you need. You know, sometimes you may have to discuss. Oh, the you know the, the network or the studio would like you know something like this. Can you? And usually, you know, for their own intense purpose, mostly receptive because we're all we're all there to do the thing. And if you're not, you know, taking them away from the immediate, you know, it's you know being you know, I guess. Uh, Mindful of the you know, the situation, if, is this a good time? Sometimes you know you, yeah. you don't want to interrupt them because they're in a space or doing something like that. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. what about this idea of eye line and like staying out of an actor's eye line? Is that something that uh, you concern yourself with a lot? Or I like to get in an actor's eye line. It makes a better photo <laughs> <laughs> when they're looking right at you. Yeah, or, or you uh, catch, no, yeah. not necessarily looking at me, but seeing both their eyes. Um, uh-huh. And I I will try to you know. Uh, you know, get the best face I can. Mm-hmm. And um, that's why I think it's important to have a rapport with the actors. Yeah. I never, I I t- really try not to ever work on a set without introducing myself. And as I echo what David said, that they're coworkers and the more mm-hmm. you treat them like that, that your partner's mm-hmm. on set, um, the more I think they're going to give you. And um you know, mm. and, I, but I'm not saying I've never been asked to get out of someone's eyeline. That has happened to me, and I think that happened to me a few times when I was uh, more starting out, mm-hmm. and um, I probably didn't know I should introduce myself, or right. you know. Right. So there's interpersonal skills that I 
have developed along the way that has, has made it more unlikely that's ever going to happen. Uh, I, I mean, I guess in, in all photography in some ways, but I certainly found that in, on set that is probably the, the most important skill is is these interpersonal skills and, and how you introduce yourself and, and make sure people know what you're up to. Um, but getting back to the when I mentioned that AD that I worked with at one point, he did not let anybody have contact with the the two or three primary stars and uh, outside of the exact work. So there was really even that that chance to introduce yourself and, and humanize yourself never happened. So that it kind of became a problem. Old school, old school though. I th- I feel like I feel like the younger generation of filmmakers are not as controlling or something. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I don't know. I just so, feel yeah. like it's been friendlier mm. and I've been doing this for 20 years. I just feel right. like sets are nicer. How is te- how is like the episodic television, the change with Netflix and HBO, has that brought a change and you guys work with both of those, those organizations compared to movie sets and old school way of doing things? Has it changed? Well, there's more? a lot of new young people working mm-hmm. because they've just a big demand. There's so much content. It's a content gold rush. So there's a mm-hmm. lot of, um, people who've joined the industry and new people working on set. and mm. This also seems to be more room for all of these people too because since yeah. it is expanding like crazy. Yeah. So there are more opportunities just a matter of getting the good ones, I guess. Mm. Yeah, said, I think also the, the mixing of genres. There's not – I think there used to be more of a hard line between, mm. you know, you did TV or you did film. Mm. And with, uh, you know, especially with all the you know, online content and everything, it's it's – Blurring the edges and mixing, right. and I think making for better product all around. So. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And for you guys, better as well in terms of the still photography, the opportunities, and, and the pay, and things like that. Uh, or do you see that bl- yet to be determined? One um, change with the television bonanza in New York for us is that we're not on the same show every day, so there is a lot of. Uh, going back and forth with our gear to different shows and different sets. Um, Whereas in my past, I would be on one film and I'd be on that film for six weeks or three months or whatever, and I'd move my gear onto the camera truck and that would be home. But now I'm, I'm often every day going to a different set, different location, you know, having to haul my gear back and forth. And that's why it's been helpful to kind of slim down with the mirrorless cameras too, because it's a, you know, it's a lot of hauling. And in general, getting back to that subject, it, you're seeing more Sony's and Fuji's on on set as time goes on. Is that fair to say? And now it'll be Nikon's and right, Canons right. But and, yeah. well, we don't see other we don't photographers. See other <laughs> oh, good point. Yeah, <laughs> we don't look at yeah. other people. Well, I, I think David and I <laughs> stuck with the blimps a lot longer than a lot some of, of the people. Yeah. younger, okay. like the newer photographers who've come in now are not even. They never had a blimp, right? Yeah, they're yeah. using Sony's or Fuji's, and that's it. Yeah, it seems to be. I mean, the, one of the very one of the few niches of photography where it makes a big difference you know yeah. the mirrorless aspect and once the quality caught up and, and the lens is why not I suppose are uh, there any set photographers out there that when they're hired you don't necessarily get them but you get one of their underlings showing up and like oh. portrait photographers it's like you're hiring so and so and it turns out it ain't so and so who shows up it's really? somebody who's trained more work oh yeah yeah, wedding photographers, portrait photographers. There are a oh, few that wedding, you yeah. hire the name, but you're not necessarily getting that person depending on how much you're paying. No, but you don't. guys are all, you're solo and that's it. You're, you're yeah. okay. I wish I could have an avatar sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I, think, uh, I think there was maybe, I heard of kind of like a, there was a group that was marketing themselves, but it was like, you know, three of them together and you, you hired the company and then you got one of three. But yeah, that's a rare situation. You usually, you know, so you get the, uh, the, Individual Ronin coming mm-hmm. into each set. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> How has the, uh, and you talked a little bit earlier about days on set and stuff like that, but with the fact that there are so many cameras out there and and, and the whole change of what we think of as images, uh, is the union still have uh, an important role in in what's going on? Are they are they dwindling? Are they protecting you guys as well? And, and all that is, is still similar as it was 15 oh, years ago? Yeah, the union's still really strong. Yeah, you, you, can't, yeah. you can't get on a set in New York without being in a union. But haven't they also made deals to say, okay, well, still photographers don't need to be on a set every day, so therefore with this production, we're going to let you just have five days or something along, um, along those lines? Yeah, but I don't... I mean, 
that's been in place as long as I've been in the union, mm-hmm. which was, I joined in 2003. So to me, that's not a big change. Right. But if you talk to someone who's been doing this for 30 years, maybe they've felt like that was a mm-hmm. huge mm-hmm. change. And what about the difference between LA and New York? Is there things to talk about in terms of the way things are done or the, I guess the amount of too work. Bright. It's too bright. In Los Angeles. <laughs> Lights bad out there. <laughs> no clouds. So, yeah, true. Yeah. And, I think I don't think there's again. Mm, wouldn't be any major differences in process. You know, we have yeah. the system, which is the system. You have people coming in from L.A. and not so much. I guess New York is going to L.A., but mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. do mix it up a little bit. So, and do you guys tend tend to stay pretty much in New York, or do you get out on location to different spots? Uh, well, we're technically well, we're Eastern Seaboard, so there's the corridor we run right. basically. You know, right. What Does that do include- you anyone go up to Maine? Does that include I Georgia? Been to Maine. I've been to Massachusetts a few times, a couple of shows in Boston and Philadelphia. Mm. Is that and because of the union in... that you keep kind of kept like Eastern Seaboard right. or is it just a common agreement among, in the trade? Uh, well, we have different – there's actually – we're sectioned into different rates across the country. So there's the Eastern Seaboard, there's the Central Region, and then there's the West. And there's different rules. You know, if you want to actually work in the West, you have to be part of the roster, which is another kind of inherited system back from the old studio days – which is just another kind of PASCO thing that you have to take in mind if you want to work in that area. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, It has to do with the California OSHA, yeah, actually. Right. It's a work safety program oh, you have wow. to do, okay. yeah. Mm-hmm. But also the uh, we get... We have the highest rates in New York, so... Yeah, which is a grandfather that, thing from the when we weren't all one national union, mm. which is awesome, so that's why this is the best place to be. Except... Mm. The thing that's not awesome about it is they will call a photographer from L.A. to go on location rather than New York because we they have to pay us they, the they higher rate. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like making movies in Vancouver. Okay, so same deal. <laughs> <laughs> it looks you can like work everywhere in else. Vancouver, right? Can you yeah, go I have, I have my yeah. uh, 6 card. David's I can Canadian. go north. Uh, okay, that's the, that's the 600 equivalent for Canada? That's Cameron Union, yeah. And, okay. And what about if you wanted to do a job on a, a non-union, or would you, or could you? Um, how does that work? Uh, I think it depends on the project. Uh, you know, obviously it's non-union, probably it's a, a smaller size. Um, you wouldn't do it? I would rather try and uh, pass it off to some someone who... Like, like me, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah someone start. Yeah, I'll make a um, recommendation. Yeah, but, but occasionally right. there'll be a commercial with a really high rate that's non-union that I'll do. Mm. Not not often, not often enough, but uh, it's that still happens for the commercial. Yeah, yeah, just where they want someone to do behind the scenes of right. Uh, right. you know a commercial. You know, speaking of the behind the scenes, you had mentioned earlier where you get requests to do that, but do you often just kind of work on your own and, and like just shoot, let's say, monochrome and and do a project for yourself, kind of documenting this production? Is there time for that? Do you enjoy that? Is there? I used to um, when I was younger. I, d- I don't now. I don't mm. have time for it. And yeah, I think and the timing is, uh, you know, having the luxury of actually right. having that. You know, I occasionally like to pull out, you know, some old film cameras to do some stuff. But mm-hmm. yeah, you know, just as far as a workflow, especially when you're getting to you know high season, you just don't have the physical days. Right. Right. It's kind of. One thing I wanted to mention, and and then this will lead to a question, I hope. But uh, the, I often say that when you think of movies, favorite scenes, or or just of movies, what comes to mind is the still photo, and and people tend to downplay that idea a little bit. But looking back, it's you know it is the record of a movie in some cases, and that sounds strange to say when there is ninety minutes of something to watch. But yeah, but that ninety minutes comes and goes. The picture stays, and the picture stays in your head. Yeah, so I it's think it's amazing that, how you know, people don't realize that. Yeah, like all the recent documentation of Stanley Kubrick's work, it's mm-hmm. all still photographs, mm-hmm. yeah. and he yeah. had a photographer there all the time taking pictures. So I guess what is your most memorable image or your favorite image? Do you have something that you think will? will stand the test of time and uh I have a lot of favorites one of them is of Philip Seymour Hoffman who you know was a great actor that we lost and I just loved the photo the film I don't think anyone saw but um for me the photo was I you know something I really cherished David any yeah I have there's so many favorite things and uh, you know especially projects you know I've had a blast, uh, you know, even just seeing the progression of my work from, you know, the last couple seasons of, uh, you know, House of Cards, yeah. Yeah. which was nice to create, you know, such a, a 
great body of work, even considering. But I think I think one of the most memorable would have been uh, you know taking pictures of Meryl Streep as Julia Childs. Mm. Oh, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a, a, a prop shoot. You mm-hmm. know, it you know it just kind of embodied the uh, you know a lot of that feeling. And you know, I made the cover of American Cinematographer with that. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you know, I may have peaked a bit too early. And uh, where do I go from there? <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Alrighty. Uh, it was terrific having both of you on. Uh, David, if people want to see more of your work, where should they go? Websites, Instagram, whatever you might have. Yeah, if you want to get uh, my ROI up on my uh, website, you can go to uh, davidgeesbrick.com. Or if you're on Instagram, you can see me at the Geesbrecht. And that's G I E S B R E C H T. Mm-hmm. Is there any other way of spelling it? You'd be surprised. <laughs> I can imagine. And we're going to, we'll post everything. Uh, yeah, everything a will link, be posted um, on the site. But yeah. And yeah. Jojo, what about yourself? Um, I also have an Instagram site that I'm active on, and it's just my name at Jojo Wilden. And I have a website that I need to keep up more frequently, but it's uh, <laughs> jojowilden.com. And I have uh, some work in a show that's opening on November 8th through December 15th at the. Piero Gallery in South Orange, and it's okay. uh, some of my artwork. Artwork, oh, uh, ooh, okay. not related to still photography at uh-huh. all. There's no people in the pictures, so that's exciting. Thank you both for being here. Okay, so goes another show. Take a minute and head on over to Apple Podcast, Overcast, Pocket Cast, YouTube, or Stitcher, and sign on for now. And as always, on behalf of Jason, John, and myself, thank you so much for tuning in today. 